How do you do, everyone? The clues to this story, which I have spread out on the desk in front of me, do not look at first as if they could contain any dramatic or important story at all. And yet you will find a set in the priceless Lennox collection in New York. A few very old newspapers, which you'll notice are dinky in size and are a rather measly job of printing as well. They were brought out in New York City a good 200 and more years ago. And the clue to the story lies in this gap, which you'll notice in the order of their issue. This tiny newspaper came out every week at first until the editor in this issue printed some forbidden news. So the next week, the paper was missing because the printer happened to be in jail during this period for libel and his press smashed to bits and its last issue ordered destroyed. Since the subject of this story is still one of the hottest issues in our country today, I hope we will be able to look through the powdered wigs and fancy costumes of the past and there meet Grandpa, who still walks among us and whose story we have called Grandpa Changes the World. When New York was in its beginning years, folks would walk a hundred miles to take in a good trial. And here was a juicy one, governor accused of sneaking tax money, at which any self-respecting governor would sue for libel, even if he weren't respectable to begin with. So the man who had printed the scandal would be pitched into jail, where by law and tradition he belonged, and so it had always been. In this very old and rich room near Philadelphia, and as the governor rages in his palace and the printer crouches in his cell, a very old man sits sleeping out the last months of his life. Here rest around him the memories of a man who had walked with kings once, had riches and honors once, Andrew Hamilton, attorney to William Penn once, writer of law, teacher of law, twister of law, the great defender, once. But now here he is only grandpa, whom we must shake awake with that furious quarrel a hundred miles away. Awaken to try his last case and change the world. Zenger's bail has been fixed. We will not sit here and listen to your complaints. If you persist... We do persist, your lordship. The bail is unreasonable and exorbitant, and we do complain on behalf of Zenger, since it is our established right in law. You are warned. We must persist on another count. Governor Cosby is a party to this case. And since the officials of this colony derive their appointments from the governor, they should not sit in judgment. You have been heard. Your meaning is clear. We find you in contempt of this court, and we hereby exclude you both from the practice of law in this court. We hereby order your names struck from the role of attorneys recognized by this court. I take it, Your Honor. That your honor intends to let us inform our client that we can no longer defend him? Or has this privilege been added to the list of rights that no longer exist in America? The bailiff will conduct you to the prisoner. But I have a wife and three children. I must earn our living as a printer. Well, there is one thing. There is one thing by the Lord we can do. We can raise a mob. And we can riot. And we can make such a great noise, it will wake up our sleepy king in England. And permit Governor Cosby to hold us for committing treason. John, in conscience, I cannot counsel you not to alter your plea to guilty. You're in prison. We're not. Well then, sir, would you have us conduct ourselves legally? So that they can legally keep our client in jail? Or send him to the slave plantations in Jamaica? Why, even if Andrew Hamilton himself were alive, he could not find a legal defense. Our ten minutes' time allowed with you has expired. John, I believe we will have to advise you to change your plea. Well, wait a moment. Wait. Andrew Hamilton is dead only as far as legal practice. He was my teacher once. He's alive, and I believe somewhere near Philadelphia. Hold up, blast the thing silent. We're coming. John, hold off for three days. We have that much time. Can you do it? Yes, I, I guess I have to. You see, I came to this country from Germany 
so I would be free to print the news. Mr. Smith, you just might have named our sole remaining chance. You're a young fellow. You can stand a full gallop to Philadelphia. God bless you, sir. Three days. Perhaps he's not, uh, not well. I, I shan't disturb him. Oh, no, indeed, Mr. Smith. Grandpa will be delighted. He adores having anyone visit him. B -b but if he needs his sleep. Uh, well, yeah, have I a visitor? Yes, Grandpa. Uh, a Mr. Smith from New York. Delightful. Where is he? Uh, be here, sir. Oh. Uh, have a glass of sherry, sir. No, thanks. Uh, my name is William Smith. I'm associated in law with James Alexander. Uh, I, I feel I shouldn't have intruded. Alexander? Uh, uh, but you're not James Alexander. He's my very dear friend. I taught him the law. Uh, sit down. Well, who's in trouble? Not Jim Alexander. Well, sir, you see, until four days ago, Mr. Alexander and myself were defense counsel for a printer by the name of Zenger, John Zenger. He publishes a, a weekly journal of news. I have a supply of copies. Uh, yes, I read that journal, sir, every copy, but this slips my mind. Was it some treason against the king's governor? Uh, who the devil let that idiot printer put such a thing in a public press? Well, the truth is we did, sir. Mr. Alexander and myself, being legal advisors to the printer John Zenger, told him to go ahead and print them. But with the dedicated belief that the king, in sending us Governor Cosby, has given us a, a stupid, blundering, crooked thief who has stolen money from the public tax funds and bought racehorses with it. Say it so. But one does not print it in the public press. And one does not advise a poor German printer to do it and get himself committed to jail. Mr. Smith, I'm going to be very cruel, sir. Why did you and Alexander advise your client to do this unless you were out of your minds? because we believed that we could get Governor Cosby into a libel suit. Then we could expose the governor in a public trial. However, when we protested the enormity of the bail set by the Chief Justice, we were both disbarred from the practice of law. Mirable dictu. Mr. Smith, you're very young. Why, if the public ever learned of the modern practice of law here, Advising a client to commit a crime, being thrown into jail for it, then getting yourselves disbarred so you wouldn't have to defend him, every lawyer in America would be bankrupt within the fortnight. I'm deeply sorry, Mr. Hamilton, but it was a matter of principle. Principle? But the first duty of a defense counsel is to get a man out of jail, not with principles. This printer is guilty. I should know. I've had a hand in the writing of many decisions in these colonies. Well, I suppose Alexander sent you down to me because I, I am the only colonial who is admitted to the English bar. And hoping my unique reputation will qualify me to defend Sanger. You know, we keep the key up here. My great-grandchildren are always taking my court robes and 
and wearing them for play costumes. <laughs> Here, allow me, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I'll have to go by ship. I can no longer take the jolting of the stagecoach. Excuse me, sir. I, I fear I'm stupid, but you consider trying this case personally? You think it was a mistake coming from me? I could see it in your eyes. Yes. I'll take the case. If you want me. Oh, of course, sir. Of course. As the official records put it in their dry old phrases, in little old New York in the summer of 1735, people had better manners than nowadays, except perhaps when they lost their tempers. Nevertheless, it must not be forgotten that His Grace our Governor was a stickler for the rules of legality, providing only that his courtroom officials did what he told them. The only proper course is to support official authority on the American mainland. While Mr. Hamilton, who so very often ignored the rules, began his struggle to throw off the weight of his 80 years. Sir, if there's anything we can do, any help, we've prepared precedents from every similar case. Gentlemen, there is no law. A great lawyer once said to me in England, there are three ways to fight a case. If the law is with you, pound the case. If the law is in doubt, pound the jury. If the law is against you, pound the table. It's been so terribly hot. Do you suppose we could ask them to open the courtroom doors when defense begins? The defendant, Zenga! Printed, and we shall have full witness that he did print. Such false, seditious, and scandalous libel. In issue number five of this same journal of his, the defendant Zenga published. Trial by jury is taken away when a governor pleases. Who commits these acts for no other reason than to take money from the public treasury and put it into his own pocket. Further, in issue number four... Please, the... please your honor. Mr. Attorney says these things are false and libelous and that my client printed them. To save Mr. Attorney the trouble of calling witnesses, I'll confess. My client printed and published them. He is guilty of doing so. Then, if it please, Your Honor, since Mr. Hamilton has confessed to the fact, I think our witnesses can now be discharged. We so acknowledge and confess and abide by it. Since Mr. Hamilton has confessed to these false libels, the jury must find a verdict for the prosecution. Oh, we confess he printed them. But since you charge they are false, libeling a certain governor, well, you must prove just how false they were, or we're not guilty. It is not necessary that a libel be false in order for libel to exist. True or false, libel is libel. True, false, well, we're getting our roles mixed. Are you confessing, then, that these statements are true? My charges could not be plainer that the words published are treasonable and seditious. Did uh, Mr. Attorney forget and leave out the word false that time? Now, now, sir, uh, do let's get on with it. And so that you will not be burdened with proving that the charges are false and the governor stole money, We'll offer you another bargain. That Zenger's printed charges are true. <laughs> Mr. Attorney, your honor is getting slightly sweaty as I predicted. Out of common consideration, we might open the street doors. During an airing of this chamber, the court will recess. <laughs> I'm very sleepy, but we'll all have time for napping in court tomorrow. I'm sure the good Attorney General and Governor Cosby's bought judges 
will cite one boring precedent after another to prove that libel is libel, false or true. Well, we'll all sleep well tomorrow. But then, sir, what defense are you planning? You're a very impatient young man. If there's no law, I'd merely pound the table. Good night, gentlemen. I'll see you in court. Thus, I have fully shown that the books are very full on libel, and that all agree that the truth of said libel need not be established. I now ask Your Honor the final opinion of this court. Mr. Hamilton, the court holds the test of libel is limited only to whether or not it creates a scandal. There can be no doubt of it. Your Honor. <sighs> I thank you for clearing this matter up. There are 12 men who will decide whether John Peter Senger lied or not. No, Mr. Hamilton, that is not the issue. The jury may only find whether Zenger published the libel. The verdict is left to the court. Gentlemen, I know you are proud and free subjects of the colony and the king. And I say that any government which will prosecute a man for libel, for speaking and publishing the truth, that government is a sword in the hands of a wicked king. And a jury is cowardly that will allow a representative of that government to so prosecute. Mr. Hamilton, you are warned. If you go further, you risk treason to the king himself. Notwithstanding. Men who do not defend His Majesty, our King of England, against outrage done by his representative, the Governor, have dared the King's awful displeasure, and may have shown craven treason in failing to protect their Majesty's reputation. God save the King! God save the King! Silence! God save the King! God save the King! God save the king. Silence! The court shall be cleared. As the second day of the trial ended, it was rumored that His Grace began to inquire of his officials as to just what they thought they were doing. His Grace spoke with his usual candor. Reveal that I am a thief, and tell me that if this printer calls me that, I must salute him and say, God save the king. <laughs> what next? Sir, if, if I may say so, you were amazing. That jury... Oh, let me be. Mr. Smith, I don't think I was ever as young as you are. If I live another day, it'll be a miracle. But tomorrow I must stop pounding the table. I don't understand, sir. You will. Tomorrow we stop twisting the prosecutor's tail and start for the first time on the issue, the real issue. But now, let me be. Mr. Smith, will you wake me up at 3.30 in the morning and bring a Bible? With very large print. Good night, gentlemen. And, sir, I warn you, any repetition and I shall find you in contempt. But you yourself will stand in jeopardy for treason. Your pardon, sir. But if this court will so honor me, I will make an end of it. For I think I will never again stand in any courtroom, save one where very soon I must stand trial myself. Forgive me if my thoughts have taken a religious turn. If there be any among you who disbelieves God's word, signify by an art. And I will omit this remark in deference to his opinion. Many of the words contained here whereon all of you and poor John Singer have sworn your oath, if interpreted by this court, would be libelous. For Moses, as one reads here, meek as he was, libel came. And if truth be of no counting, who has not libeled the devil? Again, if anyone objects to these words, I will desist. If any man did publicly publish in a manner displeasing his master, 
These verses from Isaiah, his watchmen are all blind, they are ignorant, yes, they are greedy dogs and never can have enough. Then by law, as quoted by the Attorney General, they would be guilty of libel. <sighs> enough. John Sanger never was on trial in this room, but your liberty as free men has been tried here. I labor under the weight of many years, but old and weak as I am, I would go to the utmost part of this land if I could be of any use in quenching persecution. People have the right to complain against the arbitrary acts of men in power. Men who oppress the people under their administration, provoke and make them cry out and complain, then make that very complaint the foundation of persecution and oppression. The question in this court has never been the cause of a poor printer on New York alone that we've been trying, but the question of liberty on the mainland of America. Gentlemen, with an impartial, uncorrupted verdict, we assure ourselves, our posterity, the right, the liberty of speaking and writing the truth. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Forbidden by the Lord of every land. Shut up, Dick. Shake hands with the man in the dock I just got off. Mm. Uh, thank you all very much. I have only this, I believe, sir. You have got me back my freedom, and I have got back my little newspaper. I thought if I might print what you said out there, people might be interested. If you would let me, sir. You're very flattering, sir. Yes. Counselor, would you permit me? Oh, I'd like to remove my robe myself this last time, but thank you, sir. I've always loved these little places back of the courtroom. We enter here in street clothes. Common, greedy men, full of bread, hired for money to go out there and fight in that arena. Here, we be gowned, be wig, like stage actors, and make our entry solemnly as a procession of bishops. We become priests of justice. Well, it's a long journey. I'd rather be getting home. In the small house in Philadelphia, he gathers again to the fire for the months remaining to him, there to await without fear the final guest who comes to awaken all men. Yet he would never realize that in the closing hours of his own life, there in the courtroom, part of the new America would begin. We have seen the end to one man's life, but not by any means to the enormous work which he began that last day in court. As some of you may have guessed, it is to be found in our Constitution, which old Andrew Hamilton never dreamed he would have a part in writing. After this announcement, we're going to have a look at it. The great footnote to this story, of course, lies in the Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Old Andrew Hamilton that day in court was not so much defending his client with law that was already in existence, but was actually creating law that would not be clearly written down for generations to come. And when the Bill of Rights was first being written, there on the table lay a transcript of the case which we have just seen, which is why we tried to say in our title that Andrew Hamilton, or Grandpa, did change the world. 